Hello, everyone. Welcome to another UAA Professional Development Seminar Series. It is my honor to introduce Professor Esan Salari from Wichita State University as our guest speaker today. Dr. Salari is an Associate Professor of Industrials and Systems Engineering at Wichita State University. Dr. Salari received his PhD in Industrial and Systems Engineering from the University of Florida in 2011. His research interests are in the area of operation research with applications to healthcare systems and emerging technologies in cancer treatment. Prior to his current position, Dr. Salari was a postdoctoral fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in the Radiation Oncology Department. Today, Professor Salari is presenting on real-time organ motion management in MRI-guided radiation therapy. Thank you very much, for Professor Salari, for accepting our invite. And the first course. Thank you very much, Dr. Haydari, for the kind introduction. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the College of Engineering at the University of Alaska Anchorage for the opportunity to talk here. The topic of my presentation today is real-time organ motion management in MRI-guided radiation therapy. And this is a joint work with my previous PhD student, Ali Mirzapur, and clinical collaborators, Dr. Thomas Mazur from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and Dr. Greg Sharp from Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So according to the American Cancer Society in 2021, there will be around 1.9 million new cancer cases in the United States. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States, right after cardiovascular diseases. There are several cancer treatment modalities, such as surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and some more recent modalities, such as targeted and immunotherapy. A cancer patient uh, is typically treated with a combination of some of these modalities. And specifically, radiation therapy is, is a major modality where more than half of all cancer patients receive radiation therapy as part of their treatment. So in radiation therapy, high energy radiation beams are used to eradicate cancer cells. And the goal is to deliver a therapeutic dose of radiation to the tumor region while sparing the surrounding healthy tissue and critical organs as much as possible. However, as the beam passes through the patient anatomy, it kills both cancers and, and healthy cells. So in radiation therapy, multiple beam angles are typically used to eradicate uh, essentially the, the cancer cells by irradiating the patient so that each individual beam is not strong enough to kill the cells along its path, but the intersection of all those beams will be focused on the tumor region to deposit sufficient dose to kill the cancer cells. The most common form of radiation therapy is photon therapy, which is delivered using a linear accelerator or LINAC as shown in the picture. The head of the linear accelerator is equipped with a multi-leaf collimator system or MLC that consists of rows of leaf pairs that are independently adjustable. Using the MLC, we can shape the radiation beam by blocking parts of the radiation field and form different apertures. This form of MLC-based photon delivery is known as intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT, which is the focus of this presentation. In IMRT, using the MLC system, we can form different aperture shapes and leave each aperture open for a specific amount of time, which is known as the aperture intensity and is measured in monitor units or MU. By combining all these aperture shapes and intensities, we can then create a desired intensity profile for each radiation beam, which is also known as the fluence map. For example, suppose we would like to create an intensity profile provided in the figure on the right. This fluence map can be created by superpositioning four apertures as shown on the left and leaving 
each of the apertures exposed for two, one, three, and two monitor units respectively. This process is known as beam collimation. So through the beam collimation process, we can basically decompose each beam into small beamlets whose intensities are individually adjustable. For each cancer patient, we need to determine the beamlet intensity profile or the fluence map that forms the desired dose distribution in the anatomy. To measure the deposited dose distribution from a given fluence map, the relevant anatomy is conceptually discretized into a 3D grid of small cubes, which are called voxels. Using radiation physics, we can then determine the dose contribution of each beamlet to each voxel on their unit intensity. Then the total dose received by voxel J, which is denoted by DJ here, can then be calculated as sum of all beamlet dose contributions, where here Xi is the intensity of beamlet I and Dij is the dose deposited from beamlet I to voxel J on their unit intensity. Each cancer patient requires the design of an individualized IMRT treatment plan, which involves finding the optimal radiation therapy machine settings to deposit the clinically desired dose distribution. These settings include the choice of the set of beams to be used, the fluence map for those incident beams, and the aperture shapes and intensities to create the fluence maps. So a major focus of my research is model and algorithm development for IMRT treatment planning. Now, a major challenge in radiation treatment, um, especially for lung and abdominal cancers, is internal organ motion, which induces uncertainty in the patient anatomy. Specifically, respiration may induce large tumor displacements and organ deformation, as we can see here. If unaccounted for, organ motion may lead to severe underdosing of tumor cells or overdosing of normal tissue, which can cause treatment failure or normal tissue toxicity. Several motion management strategies have been traditionally used in the clinic to account for the motion. They include motion reduction techniques, which aim at limiting the patient's breathing motion range, for instance, through applying abdominal pressure, as you can see here. But these techniques may cause inconvenience to the patient and require patient's cooperation, which may not be possible. Motion inclusive techniques, on the other hand, aim at accounting for the organ motion in the treatment planning process, uh, for instance, by artificially expanding the tumor area by a margin to account for all possible motion scenarios. However, this requires exposing a larger area of healthy tissue to radiation, which may basically increase normal tissue toxicity. Recent advancements in the area of image-guided radiation therapy has made it possible to acquire real-time anatomical images during a radiation. Specifically, hybrid MRI LINAG machines have been recently developed, which are equipped with an onboard MRI scanner to provide a real-time movie of the patient anatomy during a radiation. This real-time MRI information, which is known as Cine MRI, can be used to perform motion mitigation strategies. The nature of the corrective action performed based on the CNA MRI information varies across different motion strategies. The most common form is the so-called respiration gated treatment in which the CNA MRI is used to track the motion of a specific region of interest and the radiation beam is turned off every time the displacement in the region of interest is beyond a pre-specified boundary. However, these interruptions lead to a prolonged treatment time, sometimes by two to threefold. 
long treatment times cause inconvenience to the patient and it reduces operational throughput. Now, current motion management approaches in MRI-guided radiation therapy, such as respiration-gated delivery, can be all viewed as a feed-forward control system in which the predicted motion trajectory is used to generate a control signal and in turn a corrective action that counteracts the organ motion before it affects the delivered radiation dose. Now, the motion prediction module is needed to overcome the system latency, which is the lag between motion detection and the actuation of the control mechanism. In MRI-guided radiation therapy, uh, this latency is around 400 milliseconds. However, there is no mechanism currently to monitor the cumulative dose during a radiation, nor is there any self-correction for those discrepancies. We believe that the real-time anatomical information by CNA MRI has the potential to perform more refined motion management strategies. The goal of this research is to develop a closed loop control framework for motion management in MRI guided radiation therapy. In this framework, the CNA MRI information is used to continuously monitor the anatomical motion at the radiation delivery progress and adjust the radiation plan in real time if needed. To achieve the research goal, we employ stochastic modeling techniques to develop a motion predictive model suitable for CNMRI information. And this motion prediction model would then provide us with a feed forward control signal. We also use image processing tools to develop a dose accumulation method to estimate the cumulative dose during irradiation, which provides us a feedback control signal. And finally, using the feed forward and the feedback control signal, we formulate and solve a stochastic control problem to re-optimize the radiation therapy plan dynamically. So in the rest of the presentation, I will discuss the research work we did to develop these three components, motion prediction, dose accumulation, and radiation plan re-optimization. So the objective of the first part of the project was to develop, calibrate, and test motion predictive models that employ CNMRI information to provide the short-term trajectory of the anatomical motion in a region of interest. In doing so, we focus on the respiration-induced motion. To characterize the anatomical motion that we observe on CNA MRI, we can use either local or global image features and generate a surrogate motion signal. For example, we may track the displacement in the centroid of a region of interest shown in the red contour here and compare that to a reference image and calculate the displacement along the superior inferior direction or the anterior posterior axis to form a motion signal. Alternatively, we may use a, let's see if I can start the video here. Alternatively, we may use an aggregate measure of the deformation vector field over a region of interest, the blue contour here, and for example, we can calculate the average superior inferior displacement over the region of interest and use this aggregate measure to generate a motion signal. In this study, we use the ladder, uh, which is basically our global image feature to generate a 1D motion signal. Respiration has a cyclic behavior and as a result, the motion signal we generate is cyclic as well. Each cycle can be divided into three stages corresponding to the breathing stages of inhale, exhale, and end of exhale. 
Each stage itself can be further divided into substages, which are called motion phases. To label the motion signal with different motion phases, we use the amplitude as well as the velocity of the signal at each time point. Now, a sequence of motion phases starting from inhale and ending at the end of exhale would form a motion cycle. Motion cycles uh, in a signal vary greatly in terms of shape and duration. We characterize each motion cycle using eight features as shown here in the figure. Five features measure signal amplitude at different points in the motion cycle. And the remaining three features measure the duration of inhale, exhale, and end of exhale. We can then classify the observed motion cycles in a given signal into K clusters based on these eight features using K means clustering. Now to predict the motion signal, we model transitions between these different cycle types or cycle clusters that we have created as a stationary discrete time Markov chain, where the states are different cycle types identified by the clustering algorithm. We also model transitions between motion phases within each cycle using a homogeneous discrete time semi-Markov model. For our discrete time semi-Markov model, we add two dummy states representing the beginning and the end of the motion cycle. Specifically, we define the terminal dummy state to be an absorbing state, which marks the end of the motion cycle. Now to predict the signal amplitude at the future time point in real time, we first use our Markov chain to infer the current motion cycle type and predict the future basically coming cycles. We then use the semi-Markov model for each cycle type to construct an expected motion phase trajectory within that cycle. By combining these two predictions, we can then find the expected signal amplitude at the future time point. We can also use our semi-Markov model to detect any irregular motion pattern during radiation delivery. This is done by calculating the probability of the most recent segment of the signal trajectory. For example, we may calculate the probability of the observed trajectory over the past five type steps and see how probable this trajectory is. This would allow us then to identify and filter motion anomalies. We tested the performance of our motion predictive model on nine stomach cancer cases that were previously treated on an MRI guided radiation therapy platform. Given the MRI acquisition rate of four frames per second, which is common on these platforms, we considered prediction horizons between 250 milliseconds all the way to 3000 milliseconds in increments of 250 milliseconds. Here on the left, you can see and compare the actual in blue versus the predicted in orange signal for a sample case using two prediction horizons of 500 milliseconds and 1000 milliseconds. On the right, you can also see the anomalies detected in the motion cycle, which are basically the black triangles. We also compared the performance of our proposed motion predictive model with both linear and nonlinear autoregressive models, which are commonly used in time series prediction. Figures at the top compare the performance of our method in orange against the linear autoregressive model in green, which shows that our model outperforms the linear autoregressive model. The two figures at the bottom compare the performance of our method in orange against a nonlinear autoregressive neural network model in purple. 
And as you can see here, the performance of these two methods are much closer. Nevertheless, our method outperforms the nonlinear autoregressive neural network model, particularly at the peaks and valleys of the signal. Now, to generate a feedback control signal, we need to dynamically estimate the cumulative dose deposited in the relevant anatomy so far. To do that, the objective of the second part of the project was to develop a method for continuous online dose accumulation. The dose accumulation method we develop may also be used to compare different radiation delivery strategies. For example, we can compare the accuracy of the dose delivery under free breathing versus respiration gated delivery and see which one essentially yields a higher dose accuracy. To ensure real-time applicability of our dose accumulation method, we essentially paid special considerations to the computational efficiency of our method. On MRI-guided radi radiation delivery platforms, the CNA MRI acquired during a radiation consists of a sequence of 2D planar sagittal images over time. However, each MRI image is two-dimensional and it lacks volumetric information. But we need the volumetric information to calculate the deposited dose. To overcome this difficulty, we use the four-dimensional computer tomography or 4DCT in short, which is acquired prior to the start of the treatment for treatment planning purposes. Specifically, a 4D CT consists of a set of 10 volumetric CT images where each volumetric CT corresponds to one breathing phase. We propose to map each two-dimensional CNA MR image acquired in real time to a phase of the 4D CT image that we acquired prior to the start of the treatment. And then we use this best matching for DCT phase to estimate the dose delivered during that time step. And then we basically accumulate the dose on a reference MHZ. Our proposed dose accumulation method has two stages, an online as well as an offline stage. In the offline stage, we calculate the dose volume associated with each aperture on each of the 10 for DCT phases. This provides us with a dose volume for each for DCT phase and aperture combination. We also warp this dose volume to a reference image. These per phase and aperture warp dose volumes are then stored in memory and retrieved during the online stage of our dose accumulation method. Now, during the online stage, we map each CNA MRI image acquired during irradiation to a 4D CT phase, which we call anatomic mapping. This is basically achieved by generating a motion signal from the CNA MRI, as we previously discussed in our motion predictive modeling, and then comparing that signal amplitude against the amplitudes of the 4D CT images and assign the 4D CT phase that has the nearest amplitude and is in the same breathing stage. To accumulate the dose in real time, Basically, at each time step, the anatomic mapping provides us with the best matching for the CT phase for that time step. Also, we know what aperture is being delivered during that time step. We can then retrieve the warp dose volume corresponding to that aperture phase combination that we have calculated offline from the memory and add that to the cumulative dose so far. Using our dose accumulation method, we can calculate the cumulative dose under different delivery scenarios. The figure 
at the top here shows the motion signal generated from the CNA MRI uh, acquired for a liver cancer patient and the corresponding histogram of the matching for DCT phases. The figure at the bottom compares the dose volume histogram for the cumulative dose delivered on the different radiation delivery scenarios. Here we can compare cumulative dose on the respiration gated delivery in dotted lines with free breathing in dash dotted lines where the treatment is continuously delivered regardless of the patient motion. And also we can look at the uh, delivery under an ideal scenario where the anatomy is static. This is obviously hypothetical because we would have motion, but we wanna look at this hypothetical scenario to see what would be essentially an upper bound. As you can see here, there is those discrepancy between static anatomy and free breathing. Also respiration gated delivery would approach this static anatomy delivery. Now, given the fit forward control signal we generated from our motion predictive model and the feedback control signal that we can generate from our dose accumulation method, the objective of the third component of the project was to dynamically re-optimize the radiation plan to correct for any potential dose discrepancy that may occur due to organ motion. In developing our dynamic reoptimization approach, we focused on the MRI Dion platform, which is the first generation of MRI guided radiotherapy machines developed by the V-Ray company. The MRIDion platform has three cobalt-60 radiation heads spaced at 120 degrees apart. The machine supports static MLC delivery, which is also known as step and shoot delivery, where the radiation beam is turned off during MLC reconfiguration, as also during gantry rotation. And we propose to re-optimize the remainder of the radiation plan after each Gantry rotation. So when we are done with delivering radiation from a particular beam configuration, then when the beam is shut off and the Gantry is rotating to the next beam configuration, during that time, we re-optimize the radiation plan. To develop our control theoretic framework, we use the model predictive control or MPC approach, which is also known as certainty equivalent control or receding horizon control. To explain the concept of model predictive control, suppose we wish to control a single input and single output process in the presence of uncertainty to achieve a target output level. If a dynamic model of the process exists, then we can predict the future state of the process. So at each decision epoch, given the current state of the process and the projected future trajectory, we optimize a control sequence for the remainder of our control horizon. And the goal here is to bring the process output as close as possible to the target output that we have in mind. However, only the first step of our control sequence is implemented and the calculations are repeated at the beginning of the next decision epoch. So we iteratively re-optimize our control sequence and every time only implement the immediate part of the control sequence corresponding to that particular time step and throw away the rest. And as we move to the next time step, we basically repeat this process over and over. In our MPC approach, we re-optimize the radiation plan after each delivery stage. 
At the end of each delivery stage, we estimate the cumulative dose deposited so far, which here is denoted by vector D. We also predict the time that we will be spending at each 4 DCT phase within each of the remaining delivery stages, which are denoted by vector pi here using the cumulative dose, which is essentially our feedback signal, and the fraction of time that we will be spending within each for the CT phase in the future, which is our fit forward control signal. We then re-optimize the intensity of the remaining apertures in the treatment plan for all future delivery stages. Finally, our control action involves delivering apertures for the next immediate delivery stage using their updated intensities while ignoring basically the rest. The reoptimization process is repeated after each delivery stage. Now, the optimization model solved at the end of each delivery stage T basically aims at optimizing the quality of the final cumulative dose, which will be basically the dose at the end of the treatment session, while also minimizing the cumulative beam on time for the remaining stages, which is a measure of delivery efficiency. The first constraint here basically estimates the final cumulative dose given the cumulative dose that has been delivered so far, which is calculated based on our dose accumulation method, as well as the dose that will be delivered in remaining stages, which is gonna be in terms of the intensity of the apertures that we are going to re-optimize. The second constraint here, it calculates the beam on time for each stage, each of the remaining stages, as the maximum time among the three gantry heads. If you recall, there are three essentially cobalt-60 uh, radiation sources. So we have three gantry heads and there are apertures delivered by each head individually. So by picking the maximum between these three gantry heads, we can calculate the beam on time for each uh, essentially delivery stage. So the optimization pr uh, problem aims at minimizing the uh, weighted sum of essentially the, the, the a, a metric that measures the quality of the final dose, as well as a metric that measures the delivery efficiency of the remaining stages. To evaluate the performance of our proposed control theoretic framework, we considered four delivery scenarios. The first scenario assumes no motion, where treatment is planned and delivered on the end of exhalation phase. That's basically our static delivery. The second scenario corresponds to treatment delivery in free breathing mode, where the treatment is delivered continuously, irrespective of the anatomical motion. The third scenario considers the respiration gated delivery, which is commonly used in the clinic. It's the standard of care. And here the actual gating signal generated by the MRI DN machine is used to simulate the treatment delivery. Finally, the last scenario we considered represents our proposed dynamic reoptimization using the model predictive control approach. Now the table here compares the beam on time and different dose volume histogram metrics for a liver cancer patient. So we use D98 to measure the target coverage quality and mean dose in the healthy liver as well as max dose in spinal cord to measure normal tissue sparing. Now, if you look at the four scenarios, free breathing has the shortest beam on time, which is 24 minutes, which makes sense because 
the beam is continuously on and radiation is delivered irrespective of motion. However, you can see that D98, uh, I apologize, free breathing is the second row. However, you can see that D98, which is a measure of target coverage, as well as liver uh, average dose and spinal cord maximum dose are suffering because of the resulting inaccuracy in the dose delivery. Now, the next row represents the respiration gated. As you can see, the beam on time here is 24 minutes. That's the time where the beam is on plus the 77 minutes where the beam is off because the tumor was not within the specified range. So the treatment time is prolonged here. However, we achieve a better uh, target coverage as well as better normal tissue sparing compared to the free breathing scenario. Now, the dynamic reoptimization scenario, which is our proposed approach here, it has a smaller beam on time compared to respiration gated, and yet it matches the target coverage and normal tissue sparing that could have been achieved with respiration gated delivery. So basically we achieve the same dose quality compared to respiration gated delivery in a smaller uh, treatment time using a shorter treatment time. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, currently respiratory gated technique is used to deliver MRI guided radiation, radiotherapy plans, where the gating window is typically chosen close to the end of exhalation stage. So if this is our motion signal, the peaks represent the end of exhale phases and the gating window during which the beam is on is basically set at the end of exhalation, as you can see here. Now, however, if you notice, the gating window does not cover the entire motion range. It only covers a limited part of the motion range during which the beam is on, and the rest of the treatment, the beam is off. Through dynamic reoptimization of the treatment plan, we envision that this gating window could be expanded to cover a larger motion range. However, when we detect an irregular motion pattern or anomalies for which the motion prediction is likely to be poor, for instance, when the patient coughs, sneezes, or takes a deep breath, then we can still use the gating mechanism to shut the beam off and turn the beam back on once the motion returns to regular behavior. So those irregular motion patterns are basically these unusual valleys or peaks that we see in the motion signal over here, where our motion prediction most probably is not gonna basically um, perform a, a good prediction. So we envision that our proposed control framework can be clinically deployed not to replace the respiratory gated delivery, but to complement it, which can then lead to better dose conformity with an enhanced delivery efficiency. So to conclude the presentation, uh, we investigated the use of CNA MRI information to dynamically adjust the radiation plan in response to organ motion. We develop a closed loop control method to use predicted motion trajectory and estimated the cumulative dose to dynamically update the plan during radiation delivery. The results shown for a liver cancer case uh, show that the proposed control method achieves similar or even superior dose quality compared to respiration gated using a shorter beam on time. 
Now, there are several exciting future research extensions. Here I would like to share a few potential research directions uh, for each of the three components we discussed. For motion prediction, currently we use CNA MRI to generate a one-dimensional surrogate motion signal. And uh, we have built predictive models to predict this essentially uh, one-dimensional signal. One can instead develop motion predictive models that attempt to predict the entire image of, uh, uh, of the anatomy or the deformation vector field over time using, for instance, recurrent neural networks. For those accumulation, currently we use a pre-computed and stored uh, uh, per phase and aperture dose volumes. Uh, which are then retrieved uh, during radiation delivery from the memory uh, to accumulate, uh, uh, to calculate the cumulative dose. Uh, we can extend this approach by pre-computing those volumes per beamlet as opposed to per aperture and store them in the memory. This will allow us then to calculate the dose deposited from apertures um, uh, with modified shapes in real time. So in other words, if we do um, these pre-computed dose volumes per beamlets, uh, as opposed to per aperture, which is what we have done so far, then we would be able to not only modify the intensity of the apertures, but also the shape of the apertures in real time as well, which would allow for more um, adjustments in real time if needed. A more, um, um, finally, a more recent MRI-guided radiation therapy platform uh, is, is capable of delivering radiation treatments using dynamic MLC. Uh, so see if I can start the video here. So unlike static MLC, where the beam is turned off during MLC reconfigurations, in dynamic MLC, the beam is continuously on during treatment delivery. So future research uh, can extend our framework by developing a controlled theoretic method for this particular delivery mode. And we have done some pre preliminary work in this area to essentially come up with a very efficient uh, uh, leaf trajectories uh, to basically shorten the delivery time. And as a result, would be able to uh, you know, deliver uh, uh, better, uh, to, to, to modulate the, the beam in real time uh, you know, uh, in a faster and better way. Okay, so I, I would like to end my talk by um, acknowledging my previous PhD student, Ali Mirzapur, who worked on this project as part of his doctoral dissertation. And also um, thank my research collaborators, Dr. Greg Sharp from MGH and Dr. Thomas Mazur from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, whose collaboration and clinical insights uh, play a key role in, in the project. And also we are very grateful to the National Science Foundation for uh, partially supporting this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Saleri for the very informative presentation. Um, those of you who are online, and if you have any questions, please type it in the chat window. Andy. Can you see any questions? I do. So here we go. We got we got our first question here of at least a couple. It says, I understand that many machine learning slash deep learning approaches aren't appropriate for real time prediction. But do you think developing automatic feature extraction models would facilitate making the model more personalized? Uh, that's a very good question. So as I mentioned, you know, um, for future research, for instance, uh, one can look at uh, video analytics, uh, you know, techniques um, using uh, especially recurrent neural networks 
to predict the 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 uh, future of the anatomy, not predicting only the, the the motion signal as we have done so far, but predict the a segment of essentially the, the the future video of how the anatomy is changing. So basically, predicting the sequence of images for um, a particular prediction horizon. And I think there, you know, um, uh, neural networks obviously would be uh, the appropriate tool to be applied. Uh, so uh, that that's one area. But even within a motion uh, prediction that we have, uh, you know, already uh, uh, studied. So if, if even if we look at predicting the, the 1D motion signal, uh, you may in principle use, uh, you know, other uh, tools. Um, so for instance, here we compared our model against uh, nonlinear autoregressive neural networks. And as you can see, they have a, a pretty good performance, uh, inferior to our model, but, but it's, it's very close. So, so I think, uh, I, I, I mean, to just the, the short answer is I, I totally agree. I think there is room for, um, you know, applications of uh, neural networks uh, uh, for basically video analytics for predicting, you know, the sequence of images and also even for predicting the 1D motion signal. Now, another area also um, that comes to mind is, you know, for uh, re-optimization because we are doing dynamic re-optimization. So this requires very fast solution methods that would be able to, you know, solve these optimization problems in real time, which are typically large scale problems. So one way also use uh, neural networks, you know, for these real time dynamic optimizations uh, to, to essentially um, uh, expedite the optimization process itself. Does that answer the question? I think so. If, if there's a follow up, they, they can type it in. And then the second question here is given the outcome of action may not be deterministic, how does the model deal with these types of uncertainties? Is it that the reoptimization is helping there? Exactly. So, uh, you know, with model predictive control, um, the idea is to uh, predict a nominal trajectory for the future of, of the system. Um, you know, throughout the, the, the control horizon, and then use that nominal trajectory to re-optimize the control sequence. But then when it comes to implementing that control sequence, we only apply the first part of the control sequence and we throw away the rest of the sequence because as we go to the next time step, we calculate another essentially nominal trajectory. We predict another, um, trajectory and we do the re-optimization again. So, so because of that, um, if there are, you know, any um, issues in our uh, predictions, we would be able to compensate for them, you know, uh, down the road. Uh, so that, that's, that's, you know, the, the promise of model predictive control. Uh, but in addition to that, one may in principle use other uh, control theoretic methods. You know, for instance, we may look at uh, uh, multi-state stochastic programming, where we explicitly account for the uncertainty in our motion prediction and try to come up with, you know, uh, control sequences that are robust against these, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty. So, so both of these are, you know, potential approaches to, to be applied. But here we have used MPC uh, for, you know, computational tractability mainly because it, uh, you know, lends itself to fast uh, uh, re-optimization, which is really a, a, a necessity here because we want to um, perform re-optimizations on the fly. So it has to be very computationally efficient.
Okay, that does look like all the questions we had in chat. Um, I, I actually had a question uh, about sure. the, the research that you're currently doing. What, what's kind of uh, something that excites you about uh, the, the work that you're currently doing that you haven't yet uh, presented? Uh, so, you know, in, in radiation therapy, um, we have um, uh, new emerging technologies. And um, for instance, this MRI guided uh, radiotherapy platforms, you know, these are a, a recent, um, you know, advancement in the field and there are new emerging technologies every day. And what I really focus on is, you know, applying um, mathematical optimization um, um, and operations research to exploit the full potential of these, you know, um, technologies. Uh, so, so there is always, you know, a, a new technology and a new modality that requires customized methods, you know, to, to be able to deliver the best treatment outcome for, for the patient. And, um, and that, you know, uh, is very exciting to me because every time I see a new technology, I, 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 I wonder how I would be able to, you know, apply uh, my, um, my operation research and mathematical optimization background to that particular technology to improve upon it. So, Awesome. And then the yeah. treatments just get better and better. That's awesome. Right, right. So the focus is to, you know, with, with image guidance, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on how to uh, provide this real-time imaging information that would help improve the dose accuracy of the radiation delivery for the patient. And also, uh, as we focused here to also improve the efficiency of, of the treatment delivery so that we would have shorter treatment times so that, you know, um, we can improve the patient experience as well. Okay, it does look like our, our chat does not have any more questions. Sounds good. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. I appreciate that. And um, um, it, it, it's also very nice meeting you, Andrew, and, and, and thank you for your help with um, setting up the um, Zoom presentation. Oh, you are very welcome. And uh, I am gonna go ahead and share the, the password for today's survey on the screen. Uh, that, that is radiation. So if you are um, seeking professional development units or credits, uh, you can use that password on our website. Thank you very much. And I would like to again, thank you, Professor Salary for the great presentation. And those of you who joined us today, have a great weekend. Thank you, you too.